Most of us know and love Godzilla as well as mecha robots, but both of these phenomena share something in common besides destroying Tokyo. Godzilla and giant robots can actually tell us something pretty important about the history of post-World War II Japan. So when we think of Godzilla, aka the king of monsters, we might start drawing familiar tropes in our mind. We picture his flaming hot atomic breath, leathery green skin, giant size, and penchant for city smashing that could rival any wrecking ball. Similarly, mecha robots have their own instant recall imagery. Whether they're running amok or saving the day, these giant robots are known for their huge size and mobility, the drama of their human pilots, and sometimes their almost human-like sentience. But great art and inspired creativity don't occur in a vacuum. The rise of these genres in Japanese cinema and anime in the 1950s and 60s also reflect Japanese anxieties about the threat of radiation following the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as the rapid industrialization of that same country in the latter half of the 20th century. For the sake of this episode, we're gonna focus on the early evolution of Godzilla and mecha robots and how their widespread popularity was mirrored in the technological shifts of post-war Japan. But before we get to all the fun stuff, to test our hypothesis, we should ask, what evidence is there that Godzilla's emergence in 1954 relates to a fear of radiation following the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and why is this significant? Let's start with the tail end of World War II. On August 6, 1945, the US dropped the first ever atomic bomb deployed in warfare on the Japanese city of Hiroshima, followed three days later by an A-bomb in Nagasaki. The combined bombs killed an estimated 120,000 people, and tens of thousands more died later from exposure to radiation. At noon on August 15th, Emperor Hirohito announced Japan's unconditional surrender via radio broadcast, specifically citing the atomic bombs as the reasons for defeat. He said, moreover, the enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable, taking the toll of many innocent lives. Should we continue to fight it, it would not only result in an ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also also, it would lead to the total extinction of human civilization. So by the time Ishiro Honda's original 1954 Godzilla premiered less than a decade later, in which an ancient monster is awakened from the depths of the sea near Japan after being exposed to radiation during atomic bomb testing, it's safe to say that the dangers of A-bombs, radiation, and atomic energy were heavy on the minds of the entire world. But this movie echoed something very specific about Japan's post-war fears, which surrounded not only the balance of nature in the face of atomic bombs and radiation, but also the balance of political power in light of the US's occupation of Japan that lasted until 1952. During this time, the US issued a moratorium on discussing their bombings during World War II, fearful that it would undermine their efforts. After the occupation ended, artists were beginning to turn to the events of World War II and US occupation as inspiration for new work. Then in 1954, a Japanese fishing boat named the Lucky Dragon and its entire crew were accidentally exposed to fallout radiation after the US orchestrated a nuclear test in Bikini Atoll. This real life event inspired the opening of Honda's movie, where a boat is destroyed by the rise of Godzilla out of the sea after he's accidentally awakened by radiation. And that's not the only instance of art imitating life. Godzilla's thick ridge skin was also designed to reflect the keloid scars on the skin of Hiroshima survivors, who are known as the Haibakusha, or bomb-affected person. In some ways, Godzilla is the embodiment of both a Haibakusha, who were ostracized during World War II recovery, and an A-bomb itself, which can bring a measurable damage to mankind, because he is both the destroyer and the destroyed. Also, unlike other destructive movie monsters of that same era, he's awakened by radiation, not created from it. So he's actually representative of the destructive power and potential lurking within mankind. Shogo Tomiyama, producer for the franchise from 1989 to 2004, said of Godzilla's true nature, the fact is that humans cannot control or judge the gods. They have their own will. They have their own way. In Japan, there are many gods. There is a god of destruction. He totally destroys everything and then there is a rebirth. Something new and fresh can begin. Godzilla is closer to being that kind of god. So before he was duking it out with King Kong, Mothra, or any other number of 
spin-off foes, Godzilla was expressing a critical fear about the future of atomic energy and A-bombs. Namely, that even when we weren't busy pointing them at each other, they could still have unintended catastrophic consequences for the entire world. Okay, so we've established that Godzilla had a lot to do with residual and well-founded fears about the future of the atomic bomb and its destructive power. But besides giving me a chance to do the robot on camera, badly, how does the history of mecha robots relate to post-war Japan? Well, around the same time that Godzilla was trampling Tokyo, a new anime subgenre featuring robots started to gain popularity. Starting in 1956 with the manga Tetsujin 28 Go, we begin to see a slew of mecha robots, the word mecha being one used to describe this particular type of anime machine. The types of robots vary from humanoid robots being controlled with remote control, as was the case with Tetsujin 28 Go, to machines that are sentient and run on their own. But if there's one concept that people think of when they think of super robots, it's the ones where the giant machines are piloted by people. The first one that really exploded the idea of a human in the driver's seat was Mazinger Z in 1972. Unlike Ishiro Honda, who spent his adulthood living in the wake of World War II destruction and US occupation, Mazinger Z's creator Go Nagai came of age in a change in Japan. Born one month after the atomic bombs were dropped and four days after Japanese surrender, Nagai's childhood was shaped by the aftermath of war, but his adolescence and early adulthood were shaped by Japan's rapid growth and industrialization. Manufacturing cities like Hiroshima and Tokyo that were destroyed during the devastation of World War II were being rapidly rebuilt, updated, and expanded in the post-war era. Think about it. In 1945, the majority of Tokyo lay in shambles, but by 1964, Tokyo was on the world stage again as a shining example of industrial progress by hosting the Olympics. Olympic Games. That's less than 20 years for an entire city to be rebuilt from the ground up, and the industrial growth of Japan was kind of crazy. By the time Go Nagai created Mazinger Z in 1972, Japan had already become a force to be reckoned with in the car manufacturing industry. In 1950, Japan produced 31,597 cars total, which equaled the number of cars produced in the US in a single day. By the late 1960s, Toyota and Nissan had either matched or surpass the productivity levels of their American competitors. And while Nagai drew inspiration from other artists who featured remote-controlled robots in their work, that explosion of Japanese cars mattered. Speaking of his inspiration for his man-driven robot, he said, one day I was driving along the streets of Tokyo in the middle of a traffic jam. An idea clicked and I started to imagine that my car generated arms and legs to pass all the other cars. I returned to my studio and started to draw and design the first prototypes for Mazinger. And it was my Mazinger Z that really set up a lot of the conventions of the genre, and its popularity was explosive. It started as a manga, but was quickly picked up and put on TV. By March of 1974, 30% of Japanese TV watchers tuned in to watch episode 68 and to see the birth of the great Mazinger. It was one of the highest rated animes of all time. And like the Japanese cars that inspired it, Mazinger Z spread all over the world. It was popular in Spain, it was very popular in the Philippines until it was ordered off the air by by the dictator slash president Ferdinand Marcos, it was aired in the US as Transer Z, and it was intensely popular in Mexico in the 1980s, and was even cited by Guillermo del Toro as part of his inspiration for Pacific Rim. Which is probably why Go Nagai said, I believe anime has helped the world discover the soul of the Japanese and their culture more than anything else. And while that may or may not be true, the soul of 1970s Japan brimming with a technology-driven future was clearly very different than the soul of 1950s war ravaged Japan heavy with the dread of the atomic world. So how does it all add up? Well, we start with a giant awakened dino monster that breathes atomic breath on Japan, echoing the post-World War II fears surrounding the rapid expansion of A-bombs worldwide. We saw that this fear wasn't only centered on past destruction, but also deeply concerned with the potential for future atomic mishaps, whether intentional or unintentional. Then, around the same time, we get big people-driven robots that reflect Japan's rapid post-war expansion, rebuilding, and industrialization. So while Godzilla was the embodiment of apocalyptic fears, mecha robots came on the scene as symbols of rebuilding and the potential for growth. But no matter how you look at it, Godzilla and mecha robots are pretty cool. What do you think? Does Godzilla and mecha robots reflect the history of post-war Japan? Got any other fandoms, subgenres, spin-offs, or historical points backed up with evidence? Drop it in the comments and we'll see you next week. 
Hi guys, so I got a lot of great questions on last week's episode about Columbus and cannibalism from YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, so I decided to answer one from each. First up, we have Tweak on YouTube who wants to know if rumors of cannibalism in Africa had spread to Europe in the 15th century, and if so, did this influence Columbus's actions in the Americas? Well, I guess I'd start with the first part of your question, which is, is this even true at all? And the answer to that is that from my findings, it seems like practices of cannibalism are present in all continents and are not unique to the African continent. There are instances of real cannibalism that appear all over the world, including funeral rites and other ceremonial purposes, and a small amount of dietary man-eating. In fact, a lot of groups are still debating over how widespread ceremonial cannibalism was as a practice, especially since the topic of eating other people is considered very taboo. And as to whether or not stories of cannibalism influence Columbus's actions before he arrived in the Caribbean, I can't confirm that for sure. The clearest I can see for the rapid spread of the cannibal myth was to dehumanize the population and justify colonial violence and enslavement. But I'd be interested in hearing more from anyone with sources on a longer trajectory. Alexilar on Instagram said, I know African slaves and Indian indentured laborers told stories about European slavers and indenture officials cannibalizing or grinding up slaves and indentured laborers. But do we have any examples of indigenous folks in the Americas telling stories of Europeans engaging in cannibalism? This is a great question. So first, for anyone interested in reading more about the history of enslavement and cannibalism, I recommend Vincent Woodard's book, The Delectable Negro. In terms of similar works on practices during Indian indenture in the Caribbean. Can you drop me any citations on this history and practice? I can't say that I'm familiar with it, but I would be interested in seeing more citations. As for indigenous stories of Europeans engaging in similar cannibalism, from what I found, those who colonize other regions did often end up desperate enough to eat other humans. The most popularly told example being the cannibalism that spread throughout the Jamestown colony. But from what I found in the research for this episode, a lot of these stories were covered up or silenced in the history books by European colonizers precisely because the practice was used as a marker of unacceptable behavior. But since these stories are being investigated more and more, I also encourage all of our viewers who find more information on the topic to link it on our pages so we can all think through it together. Rebecca Kira McGinnis on Facebook told us her seniors have been watching our videos and having debates, discussion, and journal writing. So shout out to Ms. McGinnis' senior class. You guys are awesome. Keep debating, keep thinking critically, keep writing, and keep watching. And reach out again if you have any questions on the show and we'll give you another shout out. So that's it for this week. Like us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, and follow us on Instagram. Everything is PBS Origin of Everything, and we'll see you next week.